Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is, I think, my 81st more or less consecutive weekly economic outlook. Unfortunately, I'm a little bit under the weather this week, not COVID, I hope. Uh, so it's a good bit shorter than usual, but, you know, needs must. I hope it'll be back to normal next week. Obviously, top of the agenda is COP COP26, the Conference of the Parties, which began yesterday. What, what can one say? Well, Boris Johnson is, I guess, right to have been assiduously downplaying expectations. After all, the meeting really couldn't have come at a worse time. In the US, Biden has had to ditch his $580 billion clean electricity program, which had been a key part of the budget and social package that he was trying to push through, but which is currently stuck in Congress. And thanks to the disproportionate clout of Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, uh, he has uh, also had to ditch all talk of, and I quote, making coal history that's gone out the window. Now, personally, I, I'm a little bit surprised that Biden actually decided to show up uh, in person in, uh, in Glasgow. After all, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin and Bolsonaro all opted not to risk the wrath of climate activists, and uh, Fumio Kishida had other fish to fry back home in the shape of lower house elections. But I guess he saw some electoral advantage in going to the G20 pre-COP summit in Rome, where he uh, signed off on the OECD's 15% minimum corporate tax plan and had the opportunity as an allegedly devout Catholic to lecture the Pope on abortion. Uh, plus, he's only going to be in Scotland for a day and a half anyway, and he should be able to get out before the anti-capitalist demonstrations that are rock star guru um, Greta Thunberg have promised, has promised for November the 5th. What can we expect from COP26? Well, I'm inclined to go along with UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Programme, which issued a pretty dire warning last week that the world is on track now for 2.7% uh, centigrade rise in temperatures by the end of the century, and that holding the rise to one and a half degrees is fantasy. The reasons I think are pretty simple. First, with the notable exception of the UK itself, most of the climate commitments made by other countries, including the US and China, which between them account for almost half global greenhouse gas emissions, well, we are responsible for rather less than 1%, are not commitments at all. They are aspirations. And as we've seen, when it comes to coal in China and gasoline in the US, uh, they are aspirations that take second place to the practical political imperatives. In China, that means keeping the lights on and industry running. In the US, I think it means keeping the price of gasoline at the pump somewhere south of five bucks a gallon. Second, the poorer countries of the global south are starting to get bolshy. Why they argue, in my opinion, quite reasonably, should they be expected to cut their fossil fuel consumption when we in the developed North polluted our way to prosperity? It looks very much as though we're pulling up the ladder just to make sure that they stay way behind us in the development stakes. Now, you may feel that's unfair, but, but look at it their, their way. After all, the G20 promised the emerging markets $100 billion a year to ease the transition away from fossil fuels. And we haven't come close to meeting the targets that we ourselves set and we ourselves accepted. Now, India insists that if it's to meet its zero carbon goals, it needs $2.5 trillion, otherwise no go. Moreover, Modi, not my favorite politician, Modi is now saying again with some justification that we shouldn't be looking at national CO2 levels. Rather, we should be looking at the average carbon consumption of the individual, which means that we shouldn't worry about India or Indonesia's total carbon. We should be looking instead at the per capita 
energy consumption, which is only, say, one-tenth that in the US or in Western Europe. That is, I think, also an almost inescapable temptation for poorer countries to overreach. They always do. I know that there are already mutterings about a reparations fund, which has got even John Kerry warning about uh, the dangers of endless litigation in the court. So I'm not optimistic. That said, I do think that uh, the spin doctors will be hard at work making the most out of the revised pledges that were submitted to the UN ahead of the meeting. No one has any interest in admitting failure, and there will be a few genuine wins. For instance, I'm, I think, reasonably optimistic that hydrogen, green, blue or grey, and small-scale nuclear will get a boost, which is, I think, really important if we're to get anywhere close to net zero carbon. And there could well be a global agreement on methane, which is, uh, I think, much less contentious than, than carbon, not least because North American frackers don't have the same clout that the coal and oil producers do, particularly, I guess, in Canada. But all in all, my guess is that Boris Johnson will be delighted if he gets through this gab fest over the next 10 days without a major disaster. So what about the global economy? Well, first of all, last week was, I guess, another blow to any reputation as market gurus that macroeconomists such as myself might still have. Despite continuing disruption of supply chains, despite a shortage of containers, despite inflation that's now running at twice central banks' target rates, and even despite disappointing earnings from two iconic US mega corporations, Apple and Amazon, the Dow was up one point, another 1.1% 1 .1 last week. The S&P 500 was up 1.6%, and NASDAQ, top, top heavy NASDAQ, tech heavy NASDAQ was up also up 1.6%. Month on month, the Dow was up 4.4%, the S&P was up 5.7%, and NASDAQ was up 6.4%. These are record numbers. True, European stocks didn't do as well last week, but month on month, the Zetrodax in Germany was still up 3.5%, and our own FTSE 100 was up 3%. Why? Well, I guess the simple answer is that central banks are still pumping money into the system like there's no tomorrow, and it has to go somewhere. True, Canada became the first G7 country to get out of quantitative easing last week, and there is just a chance that the UK might follow suit this week when the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee meets. But, but uh, the big two are still focused on economic recovery. In the US, that means prioritizing employment, specifically the employment of low-income groups who, for whatever reason, haven't shared in the jobs bonanza and who appear genuinely reluctant to come back into the labor force. There is also, however, one other factor. Jay Powell wants another term as Fed chairman. And until Biden finally reappoints him. I think he's naturally reluctant to buck the White House and the Treasury on economic policy. And I think he's backed up by most of his uh, council members who support him. In the EU, I'm not sure of the motivation, not as sure of the motivation, but Christine Lagarde, who is, remember, a lawyer, not an economist, made it very clear last week that uh, uh, e eurozone interest rates will not rise before the end of next year, and that regardless of the evidence, she still considers that the spike in inflation is temporary or transitory or, or whatever. So what's the evidence? Well, probably the most significant economic release in the United States last week was, I must admit, a disappointing one. The flash estimate of the third quarter GDP number came in at just over 0.5% quarter on quarter, or an annual rate of just 2%, down from 6.7% in the second quarter. On top of that, durable goods orders fell in September after four straight gains, as did personal income. 
On the other hand, however, house prices are still super, super strong in the US. Um, the conference board's consumer confidence index also picked up in October, and both the Dallas and Kansas City Fed's manufacturing indices were also strong last week. Not only that, but, and I think this is important, first-time jobless claims are now pretty much down to pre-pandemic levels. Given that the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index jumped from 3.6% to 4.4% in September, which is more than twice the Fed's target rate, I would say there really isn't very much reason for the Fed to continue to sit on its hands beyond the political imper imperative of not getting on the wrong side of the administration. Maybe after tomorrow's gubernatorial election in Virginia, which could go either way and would be a big blow for the uh, Democrats if the Republicans picked it up, the Fed will feel that it has a little bit more freedom to act. But for the moment, Jay Powell appears keen not to put his head above the political parapet. As for the EU economy, well, oddly enough, the short-term outlook actually looks a little bit better than the United States, at least at the moment. In particular, the Eurozone's industrial sentiment index and the services sentiment index were all significantly higher in October, though, I, on the other hand, the consumer confidence index actually fell. However, as in the US, inflation is picking up. At the Eurozone level, for instance, it jumped from 3.4% to 4.1% in October, which again, in my opinion, makes it hard to understand why the European Central Bank chose not to act last week, or why Lagarde felt the need to pledge no interest rate increase through the end of next year. Maybe as a loyal French woman, she's reveling in Jens Wiedemann's unexpected decision to step down. A decision that, again, in my opinion, makes the Maastricht rules on Eurozone debt and deficits essentially null. Well, what about here in the UK? I don't really want to bang on too much about the budget. I envy people like Paul Johnson and Robert Choate, who genuinely find the details of the budget, no matter how arcane, fascinating. But I do note the tension between what appears to be Boris Johnson's fairly cavalier approach to spending and Rishi Sunak's uh, innate, well, or at least Treasury-inspired fiscal conservatism. Robert Shrimsley, I think, in the FT put it best. There were parts of Sunak's presentation in the Commons that sound, sounded like a coded message at the end of a hostage video. Still, £150 billion, pounds, albeit be it over 10 years, it's not chicken feed and be, will be hard to square with Sunak's two new rules. First, that day-to-day -day spending, that is spending that's not uh, defined or can't be considered investment, must be fully funded by taxation. And second, that total net debt must continue to shrink as a percentage of national income. The first, I think, may be fudgeable. The, the second of those may be a bit tougher to meet. As for the UK economy, I know both good and bad news last week. The good news was a sharp increase in the CBI's distributive trade survey for October. The less good news was a 42% uh, year-on-year drop in car production in September. Despite that, I note that the uh, government managed to upgrade its short-term economic forecasts as part of the budget package. So not bad. What else? Well, again, to some surprise, I, I note that Evergrande in China, uh, the troubled, and I think that's put it very mildly, property developer, managed to meet a second dollar bond payment last week, just inside the 30-day grace period. On the other hand, Modern Land, another big developer in China, failed to make a $250 million payment, and at least three other property groups are now in default. Despite that, I also saw that HSBC had upgraded its forecast for Chinese equities. Presumably, that's a res re response to a 45% increase in year-on-year in, year industrial profits in September. Hmm. 
That needs thinking about. China remains to me a bit of a mystery, though my reading is that Xi Jinping, if he rates economic concerns at all, places them significantly below the communist, the Chinese Communist Party's need for political control and his own personal campaign to salvage his father's reputation by undoing Deng Xiaoping's reforms. As for this week, well, it's cop, cop, cop. But beyond that, both the US Federal Open Market Committee and the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee meet, and there's at least a chance that the UK will follow Canada out of quantitative easing, perhaps even raising interest rates by 25 basis points. Other than that, I think the focus will undoubtedly be on non-farm payrolls in the United States, which are expected to be up about 195,000 in October, which is a sharp drop from 425,000 in September, anything lower than 195. And we really will have to wonder if the recovery has genuinely hit a wall. See you next week. I hope I trust my cold will be better. Uh, thanks for watching.